Toastmasters presentations. I mean, right now I'm doing a live presentation in front of people. That's a rarity for me. Usually I'm at home in my, not my pajamas, but my sweatpants, a t-shirt, I roll out of bed, I go into my home office, and I'll turn everything on. If I'm on a video conference, I might be wearing a nice shirt from here up. <laughs> on days when I'm not wearing a tube top and a thong. <laughs> That's another story altogether. The third reason, of course, if you're not curious and if you aren't a telecommuter or on virtual conference calls, it might be that it's raining outside and you want to get out of the rain for an hour, so you might not even be in Toastmasters for all I know. Who knows? That, that's possible too. Either way, thank you for taking the time. I know that most of you just came from the International Speech Contest. I'm not even close to that. I'm a CC. I'm still working very hard. I've been in Toastmasters for a while. But I know a lot about my content. I know a lot about the topic that I'm going to talk about today. And I think that makes it easier as well. It definitely makes it easier. I can speak fairly well, partly because I'm on virtual conferences most of the time. So it kind of lends itself hand in hand to that. What I want to talk about today are two different things. Speaking well in a virtual environment or on conference calls, let's, let's say and also delivering well, which is different. Understanding your format, understanding the tool that you're using. I'll talk about both of those today a little bit. What, I use WebEx, I use Google Hangouts, I've used uh, Citrix, what's it called? I can't remember. Go to meeting. I, I don't, you, we don't use that at work, but I've used it before in other situations. What other, what other formal tools have you used? 
Skype. Well, duh, Skype. I've used Skype all the time. That's right. The link. 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 Not aware of Link, but it's probably very similar. Anything Join else? Hmm? Join me. Join me. Join me. Join me. That's right. Okay, I've heard of that one as well. There are probably a dozen different tools out there that all do the exact same thing, which is allow you to have virtual conference calls with a group of people that might allow you to have a whiteboard, that might allow you to have polling questions, to have a whole bunch of different things going on at the same time, not just having a phone call with people. So it's important to realize that. Uh, how many of you are actually using things like that right now or are aware of that? About 75% of the room, that's fantastic. Okay. But then I will be asking some questions of you. I will be asking you to give me examples of this because like I said, I use WebEx a lot. I use Google Hangouts a lot. And actually I use Skype more and more now for uh, non-work reasons, for other things as well. We don't use that at work though. So I'm going to start and typically I would have a, uh, an agenda up on the screen. Because I don't, I'm always prepared for contingency if I've been working long enough to know that if something goes wrong you want to be ready for it. So this handout gives us all the information and I'm kind of going to go over some things on both sides of this handout as well while I, while I talk to this topic. And the first thing I want to talk about is speaking effectively while you're in a virtual conference, a virtual call. I'll talk a little bit about video because I know that most of these tools also have video capability. Sometimes you're on video calls. I want to make sure to note that. But that's not the first thing I want to talk about. I'll talk about that in a few minutes when I talk about delivery and the format you use. What I want to talk about are the speaking skills, though. And a lot of these are very similar to the speaking skills you'll use in Toastmasters. There's no question about that. Whether you're speaking in front of a group or speaking on a phone or speaking in one of the virtual communication techniques, it doesn't really matter. You still speak well or you don't. The ahs and ums will kill you. That's number one on my list. That's number one for a reason. If you're in front of a group of 50 people, the ahs and ums will kill you. If you're having a conference call with three or four very important people, the ahs and ums will kill you. I have a great example of that. One of the, I'm in a group at PwC of about 250 to 300 people now. And we, have a, we had a previous leader, our partner, who was in charge of our group. He's got to be maybe 55, 60 years old. Very intelligent man, PhD, partner with our firm, CPA. He, sitting across from a table, sitting across from him at a, at a table, you're astonished at how intelligent he is from a strategic level, high level thinking, as well as the low level. I mean, the guy knew details, knew everything we had to do to make a program happen at PwC. So talking to him was always easy, was always good, was always intelligent. You had to be professional, you wanted to be professional. When you were on a phone call with this guy though, and you were on a conference call, and there might have been 50 people, 100 people on the call, you know, a lot of our learning and development group was on the call, he would sound horrible. He would sound horrible because of the way he talked. And sitting across from him at a table, you didn't, you didn't notice that because everything you talked about was so high level or intelligent that if he said, oh, it, you know, you'd read his body language and you'd see that he was thinking or processing or something was happening. Whereas on the phone, you didn't see his face, you didn't see his body language. So you'd hear him saying things like, well, um, we should do this, um, and, and I think uh, that, that you know, he would he would stagger a lot, there were a lot of things happening there where he sounded more like a seventh grader than the PhD that he had. And there's a big difference and that's, that's why I say the ahs and ums will kill you on a virtual session especially. In person that's one thing, you can get away with it sometimes if you're not a high level speaker. That's part of Toastmasters, we're acceptance of that. But on a call, that's, that's something that will sink you pretty quickly. That's number one for a reason. Number two, and you notice I'm wearing my reading glasses. How many of you were at the Table Topics Speeches Contest last night? So if I say these are my Gertrude, do you know what I'm talking about? <laughs> if I don't have my reading glasses, that's my number one right there. Um, I, I need to have my reading glasses sometimes. Number two, okay, number two is slow down for a reason. And for a long time I was a victim of this as well the idea of going quickly. 
once again, in person, you can almost get away with that. You can almost go quickly, people will follow you, they'll watch your body language, they'll see what you're talking about. When you're on a conference call, going quickly means a couple of different things, or indicates a couple of different things to people. You're either in a hurry, you're urgent, you're talking about something urgent, or you need to go to the bathroom, and you're talking quickly because of that. And people tend to turn off when you go quickly on a conference call. If you talk quickly, they don't have reason to pay attention because it's hard work. It really is hard work when you talk fast. You can do it, you can get away with, with your friends, but when you're on a conference call with your team even, you want to be careful about that. You want to, I, I always say be professional, and I'm assuming, you know, those of you that are here today are in an environment where you want to come across professionally. You don't want to come across as though you're not. So going slow is important. Going slow, and that brings me to point number three, I believe, which is be deliberate. It's point number three, right? Yes. yes. Thank you. Being deliberate <laughs> means that you be slow, but you also be careful about what you say. And you don't repeat yourself. You don't babble. You don't need to because you're slow and careful about what you say. Not going slow, going fast, and babbling and repeating yourself are very similar on conference calls. My wife, of course, complains a lot that I babble and that I repeat myself. My wife complains that I babble and that I repeat myself. <laughs> See what I did there? Yeah. But the, I'll give you a second to get that. But the truth is, that comes across as though people can multitask, you know, oh, he's going to say the same thing five times. That gets learned pretty quickly. And after a couple of months, or if I have a weekly call with a group of people, and they see me talking like that, they're not paying attention as well. They're multitasking more. Okay? Let's stop for a second. What do I mean by multitasking? Check your email. Check in your email. Probably number one on the list. Anything else? Facebook. Oh, yeah, believe me, that's a pet peeve of mine. It is. Anything else? Multitasking. Put your phone on mute while you're talking to somebody that's in your presence. That happens, doesn't it? That happens, and you're like laughing, like, yeah, you're the one. Okay? It's true. What else? Preparing your size for the next meeting. Getting ready for, okay, not paying attention at all, or just minimally paying attention because you're preparing for the next meeting. All of that, and there's probably a lot more, there are probably many more good examples, but all of that drives me nuts, first of all. Secondly, it's been scientific, scientifically proven to be a fallacy. Multitasking doesn't work. It's, it's a bad thing to even try to do because you're not paying attention to the moment. You're not, it's not <coughs> you focusing on what's going on. More often than not, multitasking is very detrimental to you and to your team. There's nothing that drives me crazy more, and I have an example of this as well. There's nothing that drives me crazy more than one call that I'm on, specifically every week I'm on this call. Oh, I could say this person's name, but if any of you are related, you can go back and tell them I knew you would. Um, he drives me nuts, and I don't want to say I hate him, but I don't like his behavior at all. You hear him constantly typing in the background. There might be nothing going on or discussion on the call, but you hear him constantly typing in the background. You know he's doing something different, returning emails, you know, doing whatever. He's busy. He's a director with our firm, whatever. He's busy. I'll give him that, but not really. <laughs> and what, what proves the fact that he's not paying attention and multitasking, even though he says he's good at it, is that 45 minutes into a conference call, he'll be like, Tom, would you repeat that last question? I didn't hear that. Oh, you know, whatever. <laughs> I just talked about that for 20 minutes. You know, where were you? I don't, I don't say that loud, but in the back of my mind, I might, I might use the same time or some feature, a chat feature, to let my, one of my friends know that this is actually stupid. You know, why is he asking a question about something that I just spent the last 20 minutes on? Because he was multitasking. I digress. <laughs> so multitasking, question? Some of that depends on the agenda. Like I'll be on uh, teleconferences where there have to be reportings and individuals are reporting. Certainly. And when they're reporting about things that are not related or immediate interest to me, I hit the mute and I'm busy typing. So it seemed, seemed to me that the first mistake that this 
person is lying because he didn't hit the mute. He should be smart enough to do that. Okay, should we kick him out right now? <laughs> You're kind of going against exactly what I'm thinking is the right behavior. But this, but this is the reality, though. But I'm sure you're a nice guy otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is the reality. But it's the reality to me that, that drives people who've been doing what I do for the last 17 years crazy. Because it means I'll probably have to take 10 minutes to explain something to him a second time that I just spent 20 minutes on. But another way of looking at it, and I don't want to ask what your name is because you probably don't want to know. <laughs> um, another way of looking at it is, I lost my train of thought because of that. See? Right. See? <laughs> another way of looking at that is it's a waste of time. It's a waste of a person's time. I mean, if I spend 45 minutes, if I spend 45 minutes in here, and all of a sudden half of you come back and say, wait a minute, let's go back to point number two. Weren't you paying attention? I mean, so part of me, in a professional way, wants to say, you know what? Some of us work 10 hours, 12 hours a day sometimes. I don't want to waste more than 45 minutes on this, so pay attention. That's kind of what I'm trying to say. And some of you might be in the exact same situation where you want people to pay attention. So the funny side of that is we are going to video a lot more now. It's not just virtual communication, using our phones, using these tools. We're using the video cameras a lot more often now. And we're doing that, in my opinion, because the leadership is probably so sick of us not paying attention or us multitasking that now we're on WebEx and you know we're told in the invite, make sure you have your video camera on. Or we're using Google Hangouts, if any of you know what that is, we all have Google now, PwC. And Google Hangouts, you can video chat pretty easily. So now, of course, I always wear a shirt to work. Because of <laughs> I always have to. If I didn't, wouldn't that be weird? <laughs> so many reasons. Um, but either way, I, I mean, I think it's the multitasking thing that you might say it's a reality, but the other side is we're compensating for it in ways that I don't think we want to be. So if you find a way to avoid multitasking, if you find a way for people to be there, that's a great thing. And some of my other techniques have to do with that exactly, have to do with that precisely. The whole idea of um, letting others talk is one of those ideas. So it's nice that you did that because that actually worked really well. Letting you talk. Number four has to do with letting others talk. Why is that one important? Getting people to buy into what you're saying. Getting people to buy into what you're saying. You keep them engaged. Keeping them engaged, excellent. Sharing ideas. Sharing ideas, which is extremely important according to this guy right here. Everybody might have something to add to the phone call or say. So a good leader or a good moderator on a virtual call or a video call will make sure that he goes around or she goes around and says, what do you think, Chris? What do you think, so-and-so? What do you think, so-and-so? Not only is it more interactive, but they're always on their toes. And I say that half-heartedly. But the truth is, they're always on their toes because they might get called on. I'm not in charge of some of these people, but I have good calls. I have good calls and people pay attention because they know they might be part of those calls. They might need to give me information. They might have to be saying something or doing something or paraphrasing something or commenting on something. So the idea of sharing the floor isn't something that happens often in Toastmaster speeches. It's something specific to virtual <coughs> phone calls, virtual sessions. But it's something that's essential. It really is essential, one way or another. Even if you just have a graph on the screen, and your whole point is, well, what do you think about that graph, so-and-so? You know, can, can you understand what that's saying, so-and-so? It's, it's just a matter of asking specific questions to specific people to keep them on their toes. Other comments about that? It's a great idea. Thank you. Just it also be use, useful in speaking in Toastmasters, so that you don't talk about that much. You just say, have you ever had that experience? Or if you know what I'm talking about, that's really, that can create a conversation with the audience, much less the lecture that probably that sometimes people get to in Toastmasters. It's very true. Very true. Good point. Good point. Any other comments? The last point, point number five that I have on here that has to do with speaking skills, specific speaking skills, 
is the idea of going back to your agenda virtually and uh, vocally, visually and vocally, I'm sorry, visually and vocally. Not only do I go through and point out, you know, number one, two, three, four, five, I say number one, two, three, four, five as part of my as part of my talking on the call. That's linear thinking. Most people think linearly. Who can tell me what that means? You a straight line. I hear some people, but I they, they think progressively one item after the other. Okay, they progressively one item after. We can't think about many things at once, which goes back to your multi Thank you. Boy, you are just hitting them out of the park today, aren't you? Oh, well. <laughs> I'm telling you. This guy's going to come work for us. Um, you're right. You're absolutely right, though. It's, it's progressive thinking. It's one, two, three, four, five. Putting things in order for people, especially virtually. In a live room like this, I can point to the pictures on the wall and say, okay, look at the pictures that have women in them. Some of you might look at that one. Some of you might look at that one. Some of you might look at It doesn't matter. But if we're on a virtual call, and I want to follow an agenda or uh, an invitation even, something like that, I might say, okay, number two, look back at number two. If I said look back at number two, you all can look back at number two pretty easily without having to see me, without having to see anything on the screen. You all know that I'm talking about slowing down and the idea of how important it is to slow down. So in my mind, going back to an agenda, having some sort of agenda, whether it's a WebEx session, whether it's a phone call, a lot of times in my invites for phone calls, just two or three items. We'll discuss this, we'll make sure we agree on this, you know, blah, blah, blah. It might be a very simple agenda, but to me that's very important because of the way people think. They think like that. If you have no numbers or have no bullet points, I prefer numbers because of that. I can always say, well, let's talk about number one. And they know what to look at on their end of the phone or whatever. It just helps people. It helps people quite a bit. So that's the idea of speaking skills. A lot of those skills, as I said before, go back to the Toastmasters mentality and the whole idea of how do you present well. Some of them don't. Some of them are specific to speaking uh, on a virtual conference call. Good question? Uh, yeah, just a comment. I had an interesting experience this week. And this is very simple. It's Does it have anything to do with anything we're talking about? <laughs> I just want to know. Well, it has to do with us and us that I've been working on for a long time. Okay. And uh, uh, <laughs> it was on a phone call. And I usually, when I'm leaving a message on my phone, I will just send it straight through. But for some reason, I listened to this message, and it was very, very enlightening in terms of us and us and not being direct at all. So everyone, if you don't do that, just take a minute and listen to one of your messages you leave for somebody. For me, it really opened my eyes. Interesting for a couple of reasons. You can, first of all. You can listen to your message before you leave a message on a lot of phone systems, voicemail systems. Some of you might not know that. If you don't find out how you can do that, it's pretty easy to do. I do the same thing and I'll leave messages similar to my agendas. The first thing we need to do, the second thing we need to do, is the third thing we need to do. I make it very clear for a person on a voicemail, partly for my own good, otherwise, as my wife says, I tend to babble and repeat myself. <laughs> Crazy woman. But, <laughs> um, but I, I agree. I agree wholeheartedly. It's also a great opportunity to see your ahs and ums and to repeat, you know, to repeat what you had to say instead of five minutes, <coughs> taking three minutes and doing it much more succinctly, carefully, etc. I'd just like to add a point about the agendas and tie that to multitasking, because I like you do this kind of all the time. Yeah. Conference hall. Uh, the agenda is critical for two reasons, so that you can get people who want to engage to know where the part they care is in the agenda. And depending on who they are, I always review the agenda and ask people, is there anything you want to add? Do we need to change the sequence? Because if there's something important that the whole group wants to hear, we move it to the front so they can all hear it and know they're all engaged. And also it allows the person who might be multitasking, of which sometimes that's me, to know when I need to pay attention and when it's safe uh, to not pay attention. Yeah, that's good. That's, that's accurate. That's very accurate. 
good point. I, I know I saw a hand over here as well. Well, I was I was going to build on what you were saying. <coughs> Most of the tools that you can use for these virtual conferences let you record them. Yes. And that's very valuable. Just like recording your speech, giving a presentation to Toastmasters. Uh, I found, and not only, I, I think it's really designed so that people can listen to your conference after the fact, but it's also very good for you to hear yourself give that presentation or give that speech, and you can pick up on a lot of things that you didn't while you were in the middle of giving the presentation. It's a great so point. If you have that tool, you should turn it on once in a while, even if you're not going to make it available to everybody else so that you can go back and look at it. Two sides to that coin, because that's a great idea. That's an accurate idea. One side is, in Toastmasters fashion, yes, you can definitely see yourself. Be aware of how you're speaking, going too slow, too fast, whatever. The other side of that is, when a client wants to have a call recorded, this is where I'm going, it's probably because they don't want to pay attention sometimes. And they'll just watch it later. And catch, you know, they'll watch it in like five minutes and get the key points they need to get out of that call. I've had that happen a couple times too. So it's a good side and a bad side, definitely. I agree with you though. I agree that it's good to have that recording to look at. <coughs> the same reason we sometimes videotape ourselves doing speeches, because we might see ourselves doing something we had no idea we did. We had no idea that it was a common trait or something like that. Excellent. One of the best ideas for seeing yourself in the moment on a video conference to put a small mirror next to your monitor. Watching yourself teaches you an awful lot about yourself and keeps you on point in giving your presentation. But I think that might be a little distracting. I know that on my computer screen when I'm doing a virtual presentation, I can turn the camera on or off to see myself. And, and it's very distracting. I'm, I'm if I so he's myself. the kind of guy who stares at himself in the mirror, too. I'm, 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 is that what you're saying? I'm definitely I'm not saying that. That's not what I'm saying. You hold the mirror and you glance into it. While you're talking, you get an idea of how clear you are and what kind of presence you're giving to the people on the screen. I think that the key point there is something I learned a long time ago. Having the mirror just to show that you're smiling. Because I, I can't remember who told me this such a long time ago, that if you're smiling, they can kind of tell you're coming across more positive, and that's a great thing too. I, I don't want to, I want to be conscious of time here and kind of go through some of the delivery skills that I have on the other side of the sheet, because I think they're equally as important, the delivery skills. I, I put a few things there that are solely related to virtual conference calls. One of those is knowing your format. I mean, you named, we named, seven or eight different formats. I said I use WebEx, I use Google, I use Skype once in a while. I know those pretty well because I use those so often. I know them well enough that if I know I'm going to do a certain thing, I'll make sure that I use the right tool for that and that I'll have the slides set up so that I can do a whiteboard or so that I can do a polling question if I need to or something like that. I think that goes without saying that you want to know your format. When I'm talking about a telephone call, a conference call that you're on, without any sort of technology other than the phone. What do I mean by that? Knowing how to use mute. Or knowing how to force somebody else on mute. You've been on a few calls like this. That's exactly what I mean. I've been doing this 17 years. I'm very conscious of my mute button. I understand how to use it. I understand how not to use it. To say that, well, this makes me sound a little bit anal maybe, but to say that it drives me nuts when every time the same person, oh, sorry, I was on mute and I didn't realize it. After about a year and a half, you're like, dude, don't you know how to use your phone? You know, little things like that. As you can tell, some things drive me crazy. That drives me a little crazy. But yes, when you're just using phones, the mute button. It's important to know, yes, I'm on mute. No, I'm not on mute. If you need to put a post in it up or do something like that, do it. Because the other side of that, and I can be funny about it, but I can be serious as well. I'm on a lot of client phone calls with partners, directors, important people in our firm. I don't want to sound like, oh, you know, I don't want to sound like an idiot. Like, oh, I forgot that I was on mute. They don't do that very often. It's something that I only see in our team and, you know, something that I definitely think of isn't as professional, isn't as high level. So it's important to know your platform. 
Question. Well, one, one of the things I, we're on conference calls, and if, because I'm at a uh, store, if I put my call on hold, it throws it into music, and then the whole conference, oh, yep, it's music. Oh, you know? That's great. Yeah. So, so people can dance at the board. Oh, yeah. so be aware that goes back to my I like to dance, you know. <laughs> you just need to be aware of you can't use the whole button yeah. on a conference call. It will have music. Mm. Just good to know. Wrong. Most people don't know if they have music or not. <laughs> yeah. Surprise, surprise. So all of a sudden everybody hears music and you're like, uh-oh, who is that? <laughs> Obviously. Um, the second thing, and again, I want to be conscious of time here, and I'm sorry, because I, I think I've had maybe six hours worth of material in 45 minutes here. I know there's a lot of discussion we could have as well about this, but I want to make sure we get the gist of it, the, the plain points we need to. The second point is, Genuine value. Make sure the call is adding genuine value. And I simply mean, what's your objective? What's your goal? What's what's your next step or your action item that comes from that? Because the people I work with don't like to waste an hour. All my calls now are 45 minutes because of that. And if I can do it in a half hour, I'll do it in a half hour and make certain people happy. But I don't want to waste a half hour of their time either. So I had better start the call with, this is what I want to make sure we get accomplished on this call. These are the next steps that I want to come from this call, or something like that. I want to make sure I'm delivering genuine value. This might not always be the case in my teams. We might just have a weekly call where we just catch up on stuff. But if it's anybody, I hate to say more important because that's not what I mean, if it's anybody higher level than my team, a client or something like that, I want to make darn sure that before I go into that call, I do my homework and I'm ready to have that call with them and then I'm able to deliver genuine value. I was going to say that if you have a half an hour phone call, for example, when mm -hmm. I had a phone call uh, for a group of executives a couple days ago, I got everything done in 15 minutes and they were so grateful for the yeah. 15 minutes because I know they're, they're busy people. So you Absolutely. can be a hero if you can, you know. A good way to look at it. You can be a hero. <laughs> I'm your hero. Go dance now. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. Very good. The next point, the I'm using my glasses again here. The third point on the list here is similar to the speaking, where you want to have a structure, but don't rely on PowerPoint. I, I knew coming into today, I may or may not have PowerPoint. I made sure to have my agenda kind of on a sheet of paper, just in case I needed to hand it out. I wasn't going to hand this out till afterwards otherwise. Whenever I set up a call, as I said earlier, I always put two or three bullet points or two or three numerical points in that call to kind of give them an agenda. When I have a slide deck, it's not 73 slides long. I might have five slides. That's what I had today, five slides. I figured I only had 45 minutes. Five slides is more than enough, all right? It just has the agenda and these points on one slide, those points on the other slide. I saw. Uh, I believe her name was Amy talk earlier. She talked a lot about presentation and how important it is in presentation, the fact that you don't use a slide deck. And I agree with that. I try to avoid using a slide deck when I present live, unless I really need to. But when I'm presenting via WebEx or something like that virtually, I tend to use something just to give everybody the agenda, if nothing else. You, you make a habit of sending the agenda beforehand by by you know. I do, yeah. Always? I try to make a habit of that. Just because, as you said earlier, they might have other priorities on their mind, whether it's my team or whether it's a client. They might not want to talk about anything on the agenda. There's another reason to send an agenda. If it's a complex topic or a controversial topic, you got to make sure you keep people on point because if they want to take you in other places, you, you're in control of the call, at least at first. And you can say, here's what we're going to discuss so they don't go off on tangents that one, you're not prepared for, yeah, yeah. or two, that are really not productive, as you said, value. Well, I really like your idea of making sure you start the call saying, OK, I sent you my agenda. This is my agenda. Does anybody else have anything else we want to talk about instead? Or is it OK if I go through this? Because I don't want to waste their time if they have something on their mind. You know? Absolutely. I think PowerPoint is a great uh, tool to use because it makes the presenter think a lot about what they really want to present. So putting it on a PowerPoint, three, four slides before the call, um, always helps me as a presenter before I go into a call. I, I agree. I mean, yeah. I, you want to be succinct, you want to be clean if you need it. 
keep it simple. And this is in our, you know, my environment and my situation. If you're teaching elementary school, it might be completely different. I don't want to say it's not okay. I just want to say it's something that I avoid for a very good reason, unless I need to use it. And I can give you plenty of examples of where I do have 60 slides. I have five slides at the beginning, and everything else is in the appendix. So when I do send it, they have all the evaluation information, they have all the other information, but it's not part of what we're going to talk about for that hour. They just have it in case they ask about it or want to see it. Tom, a question? Yes. You made a comment about that when you were doing a face-to-face, -face, you, you tried to do it PowerPoint. Did I misunderstand that, or do you have a guidance on that? No, I would have used it today, but I would have kept it very minimal and very simple. Because I think, as Amy said earlier, if some of you were in her presentation earlier today, you don't want it to be distracting from me up here talking. And if everybody's busy reading every little thing that's on there, you're multitasking, believe it or not. And as I was pretty clear about earlier, that's not true. The fourth point on the sheet is that I, I say use your tools and your voice. And I can be pretty clear about this pretty quick. You obviously are going to know your platform. Don't rely on just your platform. If something happens and you're on a virtual call, a video call, and all of a sudden you can't use it, make sure that you're able to talk about what you need to talk about. It's that simple. Make sure you've done your homework ahead of time, whether it's with your team or with a client. Make sure that you're clear on the, the ability to um, use your tools, but use your voice. Number five is one of my favorites. Number five, eliminate distractions. If you're a telecommuter like I am, you hear kids once in a while crying. You hear dogs barking once in a while. My favorite thing ever, and if you can top this, I'll give you a dollar. Okay. Do we have any toilet paper? <laughs> I swear to God, that really happened. Okay? I can name the person. It wasn't Kevin. I can name the person that happened to because he was too busy typing. But that's, I mean, to me, that's a distraction. With your team, distractions are one thing. That's okay. It happens. It happens. Whatever. When you're on a client phone call or an important call with partners, with directors, with people that you want to be professional with, you don't need someone yelling in the background. You don't need your wife watching Sex in the City in the other room. You don't need certain things happening. So you're more careful about that when you're telecommuting or when you're on a phone call at work even. What are some other distractions that you hear a lot? Grandfather clock. Grandfather clock. I thought you said your grandfather snoring. No, grandfather clock. Grandfather bong, I know exactly bong. who it's coming from. Like, okay, oh good gosh. point. I, mean, I had a supervisor who owned six parrots and two cats. And so the parrots, the parrots would fly around her apartment and oh my gosh. she'd be on calls. I mean, that's, that's interesting. Let's just leave it at that. That's interesting. <laughs> Different style of life, obviously. I just dislike it. In an open environment, have my headset on, and I'll be talking, and people walk up and start having a conversation with me. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> well, that goes back to a point that was made earlier about putting your phone on mute because somebody walks up to your desk. Right. That's going to happen. That's reality, too, and that might not be great, but that's, you know, one of the reasons a lot of us are going to telecommuting, too. And if we know we're going to be on the phone all day, I'm not even going to bother going into an office. No. Well, I would also say, too, if you're on video conference calls, the environment that you're in can mm -hmm. also be distracting. It, it may not be audio, but the visual can also be distracting. YouTube that sometimes, and you'll see people <laughs> dancing in the background. <laughs> you'll see all sorts of crazy stuff that really does happen in team calls or things like that. It just shocks me. It really does. Seriously, YouTube we have that sometimes. one guy who is deliberate. He'll go... He'll walk off, and then he comes back to the scene, and he has a help football helmet on. Okay. Okay. I mean, that can be funny. In a team call, you're right. I mean, you can have some fun. I don't want to imply that you can't have some fun. It's just there is a time and a place for that, and I think you're all adults, and you all know that. The last point on that sheet is equally important in my mind. I have a standing desk. I have a desk at home, where it's called a very desk, where I can... There's little springs on the side, and I can pull it up. I stand most of the day when I'm working at home. I can put it down when I want to sit down sometimes if I just need to relax or whatever. I've had that for three or four years now. It's easy for me to be on conference calls because I have headphones that are wireless. I have everything set up for that kind of situation. Where I'm going with this is when you're on virtual calls, and you're on them all day or enough of the day, sitting at a desk for eight hours, 
isn't the healthiest thing in the world. Get up and move a little bit. It gives you energy. It really does give you energy. Kind of like being in front of a room full of people, <coughs> virtually. You don't have that energy when you're sitting at a desk. The scientific thing about that is, you're putting pressure on your diaphragm. It's just a whole different breathing exercise when you're standing up versus when you're sitting down. And that's a fact. So stand up once in a while. You'll see a huge difference in how you feel. Maybe not how you present, depending on who you are or what you're capable of. But in how you feel, that might be enough to make a difference. Definitely. Questions or comments about that? Yes? Comment on that. Build on that. When human beings stand and walk a little, they remember two or three times as much. So certainly when you're on a conference call, you, I've, if I walk around, see, I just walk around the desk every seven to ten minutes, my retention rate is higher than sitting down. Just getting up and moving, getting the blood yeah. flowing. No, it's, that's not yeah. a personality-based thing, it's physiological. It is, and after three or four hours of doing nothing but sitting at a desk, you get kind of run down, you start eating the M&Ms or whatever. It's, it's not a good thing. It's not a good thing for you, definitely. You don't need any M&Ms for me. <laughs> I have no problem with M&Ms. Do you want to say something? Yeah, I have a caution to note, not for video calls, but I watch a lot of professional association webinars. Sure. And they're videotaped live. Yeah. And during the break, when the speaker mm -hmm. thinks that they're not being recorded, ah, it's still yeah. on. So I hear a lot of gossip. That's a, <laughs> I, I, that's a great point. I don't know if you don't bother telling them. I will add that to my speech. So I'm just like, I don't know if that point. Just make sure that you don't say anything close to it with your microphone. That All right. Watch your Good point, definitely. I know that we're almost out of time, actually. I see a little red card being held up, and we all know what that means. <laughs> that means calm, time. Um, the only thing I would say is that I, a lot of this came from my own personal knowledge. I've been doing this a long time now, and I think I'm pretty decent at it. I'm always learning. I'm always developing new techniques, new styles, and, of course, technology is always <coughs> evolving as well. The one thing I would say is that also this was in a Toastmasters magazine article a few years ago. I have copies for everyone because I'm going to get Make sure you exactly. <laughs> Make sure you grab one after the presentation. It's a great article about webinars and virtual presentations. It's from 2012. Think about that. 2012. How much we've evolved since then. In five years, we're all going to have chips in our head anyway, but that's a little <laughs> I know we can talk about this for another hour or so. There's probably a lot of question a lot of example a lot of other things i appreciate you taking the time go eat dinner walk around a little bit freshen yourself up and <coughs> I see something. question the, uh, this the video of this session and all the sessions that were videoed today will be available a week from tomorrow on at tim's video t-i-m-s-v-i-d-e-o.com Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Unless there's speaker objections. Thank you very much, everybody.